As much as many would like to believe that this physical reality we all inhabit is all that exists, there are numerous examples of other realities and dimensions and entities that coexist along with us. Shadow beings and the jinn are two very common examples that reality is far more multidimensional than most could fathom. But who are shadow beings? What are they? And why are they seemingly invading our three-dimensional space? I asked renowned paranormal researcher Rosemary Ellen Guiley and met physical researcher and filmmaker Sean Stone these very questions. And not only did they have a lot to say about the subject of shadow beings, it seems the beings themselves had a few things to add to the conversation. Take a listen. I'm so thrilled to be here with two people who I consider to be what I'll call metaphysical aficionados, both from an historical perspective as well as modern day. Rosemary Ellen Guiley is an extraordinary researcher in the field of parapsychology, renowned for her painstaking investigation into all things paranormal and all of its dimensions. And Sean Stone is not only a brilliant filmmaker and experienced show host in his own right, but a most inquisitive and well-read researcher in the fields of metaphysics and esoteric philosophy. So welcome to you both, and thanks for being with me today. Thank you, Alexis. Thanks, Alexis. Great. Well, we're going to have a great discussion today. We're going to spend some time talking about what are called shadow beings and also the jinn. Uh, This is a term that is readily used in uh, Islamic faith to describe a race of beings or entities that have been living side by side with humanity, apparently, for millennia. So I'm going to start with you, Rosemary. You call the jinn um, a supernatural race of beings that share the planet with us. And you've said that they were here before us. You say they're from a dimension that's connected to our planet. I'd love for you to elaborate on that. In their earliest lore, uh, and there are different accounts of the jinn, but they bear uh, some common similarities. In the earliest lore about the jinn, they were here on the planet first and had dominion over it. And for one reason or another, lost that dominion, either by falling out of favor with uh, God or uh, losing out in other ways to human beings, a combination of various circumstances. And so they retreated from uh, the main physical world uh, into literally kind of an underworld. And even in the early lore, we find accounts of them going underground, living below the sand and caves, uh, beneath the earth and in uh, also in lonely remote areas. Uh, very similar to a lot of uh, stories told about the fairies who also went underground um, when they lost dominion to human beings. And uh, from a modern perspective, uh, we can look at this rather as literally underground to another dimension and that uh, the earth does have different dimensions attached to it Uh, We have our dimension, our reality, and then there are beings like the jinn and other beings as well who also live on the earth, but they vibrate at another, uh, another rate. They're literally in another dimension, and so we don't really see them all the time or experience them all the time, only when the uh, various realities interconnect or even collide. And uh, it seems that uh, some of these beings, including the jinn, uh, who are very good shapeshifters, uh, have the ability to find these uh, thin spots between dimensions and uh, can uh, often come into our reality at will. We don't seem to have the same reciprocal capability, at least yet. Uh, and when they do, uh, if they are of a certain temperament, uh, they may pester us, harass us, trick us, mm-hmm. attach to us, even possess us. Mm-hmm. So that's the short of it. That's the short of it. And I know there's a lot of meat to it. So I want to get into a bit of that uh, right now. Well, you know, uh, you've been studying shadow people for over 10 years now. And in the course of your research, Rosemary, you've made a correlation between what are referred to as shadow beings and the jinn. How did you come to that conclusion? It was through a lot of analysis of patterns and experiences and uh, also uh, information that was initially volunteered to me by shadow people experiencers. Back in 2004, I started uh, studying uh, this encounter experience, uh, trying to figure out who exactly shadow people were and uh, what their uh, reasons were for uh, approaching people in certain ways, especially in bedroom invasions. And 
uh, I uh, one by one I eliminated various categories of beings because um, the patterns of behavior described by shadow people just didn't fit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I discovered that uh, the jinn were a perfect fit, and that came about through um, analyzing uh, these pa patterns of hundreds and hundreds of um, descriptions of shadow people with descriptions of the jinn. And um, then that further led me into the abducting ET arena because um, uh, a high number of shadow people experiencers volunteered that they were also ET ab abductees. Mm -hmm. it would be, I don't know if this information helps, but I've also been abducted by ETs. Hmm. And uh, so I discovered then through uh, doing additional research that uh, there was a very strong link between shadow people and abducting ETs. And uh, the conclusion that I've had that shadow people are a form taken by jinn, um, I have uh, held on to that now for a good number of years. I haven't come across anything that um, persuades me otherwise. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I do want to make uh, make that connection a little further into our conversation about if there is a correlation, literally, between these entities of shadow beings, jinn, uh, you know, extraterrestrials, interdimensionals, extradimensionals. There's just so there's such a cornucopia of uh, influence it seems here. But uh, Sean, I want to turn to you now. Now, you know, I know that you uh, have in recent years become a follower of the Islamic tradition. Was that sort of your impetus to understanding the jinn, or did it start prior to that? Well, it goes back to when I first learned the word jinn, mm -hmm. which, as we know, in the, it really translates in the Western world to genie. So actually, everyone has heard of genies, but we don't realize that um, when people speak of jinn, that it's the same thing. So I learned the word jinn when I was working on my film Greystone Park, mm -hmm. which was based on a lot of real experiences that I had with my co-writer and co-star, Alex Wraith. Now, Alex is of Lebanese ancestry, so when we spoke about these shadow entities and this world that we were entering, he told me about the jinn, sort of, uh, I think they call it, they say uh, it's, it's like a smokeless, a smokeless fire, right? That, they're, they're right? that they arise from, isn't that the term, Rosemary? Uh, yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, smokeless fire. And so... He described how, well, what's interesting about that, that notion of smoke with fire is it sounds very much like a plasma, right, or some kind of, um, some sort of plasma-based energy, right? That's the fourth state of matter is plasma. So maybe that's what, that's, you know, where these, these gems reside. Now, when we were exploring Greystone, obviously we had many encounters with, in, you know, invisible uh, and invisible things that would make noises or things that, you know, things that could create movement without, you'd see things fly by themselves or you'd hear screams or you'd hear, you know, haunted, you'd hear ha sounds of haunting, but you weren't sure where they were originating from. So I think, you know, it's, it's a strange thing where oftentimes people will say in the Islamic world, the jinns just account for all the paranormal phenomena. Right. And then they kind of throw everything into that batch. So whether it's, um, an alien, what, what, you know, what we in the West would consider like an alien, gray-looking creature, or um, a fairy, or a, uh, a demon, all gets lumped into the category of jinns. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's, that's correct, because in the course of my experience with Greystone, I was also had a shadow phenomenon in my room, mm -hmm. and that had been sent to me by a, a friend of mine who practices witchcraft. And so she had basically, uh, you know, conjured a shadow being and sent it to me. And my brief communication with the shadow being a little more telepathic thing because it wasn't, it was it was lingering in the room. And so when I went to like a, a, like a alpha kind of state where I'm near, you're near sleep, and then I could sort of communicate with this thing, it seemed to be saying that it was from, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago and it was some kind of sorcerer. And what's interesting about that is this, this old, um, Carl Casaneda book. Um, I'm not sure. Actually, I can't remember which one it was, but he basically writes about these flyers. This, the Casaneda writes about the, what we'll call the flyers in the Mexican tradition. And the flyers sound very much like shadow people. They're basically psychic vampires. That they actually were like the shadow forms of these old sorcerers and uh, people who practices who practice witchcraft. And he said, well, they, they buried themselves, and they then were able to project out of their their corpse. They, they were not dead. They buried themselves alive and were able to basically bring their, their body temperature 
temperature and their energy get to a very low state to survive for long periods of time, maybe hundreds of years. And in the course of that time where the body is buried, they would then project out of their body mm-hmm. in a shadow form to feed energetically on people, you see. It's very, So very, yeah. that actually may be where some of the shadow phenomena is coming from, coming from which is why people often say, why, you know, they, some people who knew this, they said, why do you think shadow people wear hats? I said, that's, that's exactly my question. You know, if this is some kind of um, alien being, why does it need a hat? And the, 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 the reply I got was, well, they're protecting their crown chakra because uh-huh. they're, actually project, they're actually projecting in an astral sense. You know, that astral projection is right where you're entering a different dimension of existence. And when you're basically protecting your, your crown chakra so you don't detach from it or, or let's say, get lost in the mm-hmm. process of this projection. That's so that's a- actually where... I, got, I, got, I actually understood the shadow beings are, are oftentimes sorcerers or people back, or, or, or perhaps you know, ancient, so ancient sorcerers who have passed on into, this, into, the, into the astral. Mm-hmm. And I think you get a feeling for that in the film Insidious, where they kind of describe the astral plane, right, where there's all these beings that get lost or cut off, and they're, they're dwelling in, in the outer, called in, in that Insidious franchise. So mm-hmm. that may be where some of the shadow phenomenon comes from, and I'm not sure how much, you know, obviously the gyms, could be could be shadowy because people when they do deals with genies they do conjure these beings in sort of magic rituals and oftentimes those beings can appear as a sort of a smoky form or a, 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 an un, a, an inchoate kind of uh, substance that you're not quite sure what it is mm-hmm. so there are some certain certain shadow phenomena that can be gems but I wouldn't think they're all gems. You know, you bring up a good point, something I want to I, I plan to uh, bring up uh, later in the conversation, but now I think it's appropriate. You know, as you're telling us, uh, Sean, about how this particular individual had, uh, as you described, sent you, uh, you know, during an act of uh, some form of ritual, was able to send you this sort of uh, figure. Uh, you know, I've often wondered whether these jinn or shadow-like beings are somehow a throw off throw off, I should say, of, of the experiencer's own consciousness, somewhat like a tulpa, tulpa being a conjured entity that comes from the experiencer's own energy, somewhat like a poltergeist effects. Many people think that some of the poltergeist activity that we uh, witness is coming from the electromagnetic field of the experiencers themselves. What do you think? I'd love to hear from both of you in that regard. Um. Could you um could you repeat that, Alexis? <laughs> I got a little muddled on my end. I want to make sure I answer yeah, the question. Let's see if I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, see. you'll have to edit that. I just want to make sure I'm answering the question I thought you asked. <laughs> uh, in in a nutshell, what I'm saying is, you know, just to sort of piggyback on Sean's comment about sort of conjuring uh that was, you know, the the person that had sent him uh, this sort of shadowy figure, could it be that at least in some cases what experiencers are seeing or perhaps a throw-off of their own consciousness, almost like the, the shadow part of themselves that's being reflected as if it's a separate entity, but could be some aspect of themselves? Uh, well, you can make an argument along those lines because um, I found in a significant number of shadow people encounters that uh, emotional upheaval seemed to be uh, one of the key factors behind the start of the experiences. And these would be individuals who hadn't had any prior history of shadow people visits. But they were going uh, through periods in life where they were in tremendous upheaval. They were sad, angry, depressed, um, very stressed out through circumstances in life. And while going through these Mm -hmm. periods of upheaval, uh, that seemed to attract these shadow people visits. Mm-hmm. And, uh, now, my own feeling is that shadow people are drawn to intense emotion like that because uh, they they literally feed off and vampirize uh, that, that sort of energy. And uh, that when they appear in shadow people form, they often uh, evoke tremendous fear in people, and that also is an energy that they seem to, uh, to want to absorb. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... It's very difficult to draw a black and white line uh, that separates all of these factors. There could very well be some projection from the person uh, unwittingly that enables or energizes this sort of manifestation to take place. And I just want to add another 
comment to what Sean was saying about the hat because people ask me that all the time. You know, why do these beings have to wear hats? Mm -hmm. And uh, they're often weird hats or, uh, you know, old-fashioned hats. Uh, and why would an entity need to wear a cowboy hat or a stovepipe hat or a fedora? And um, there could be a number of reasons, and Sean brought up a very good reason. Another reason, uh, and this goes back to lore about the jinn, is that when they shapeshift, um, supposedly they can't get everything perfect. Uh, and there's a giveaway characteristics. In old times, it was often believed that it was the feet because people kept their um, their legs and feet uh, covered. And so if you were able to glimpse their lower uh, legs, uh, they might be revealed as animal-like or very hairy, and that would be the giveaway for the djinn. Mm -hmm. um, well, I found that in many cases of shadow people encounters today, if they're not wearing hats, there's something very malformed or misshapen about the head. And so my conjecture has been maybe that's something that um, doesn't form very well in the shape shift, and so they plunk a hat on it. Uh, to cover it up. Um, also, there's something I think a little more terrifying to people about a solid black silhouette, a humanoid silhouette, uh, of an, uh, with a hat on. Uh, hats, uh, certain kinds of hats, have the uh, the unspoken message of authority figure or uh, maybe even danger, and um, that could have uh, a subconscious effect on percipients as well. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Yeah, the hat seems to be a ubiquitous part of this. So there's certainly, you know, I in my collecting stories about these sort of shadow uh, person visits, I've, I've heard the gamut at this point, but clearly the, the that garb, including the hat, seems to be quite common, and yet... Uh, let us not preclude any other, you know, appearances that the, that uh, they may take shape in. Well, you know, I want to go back a little bit because we're, we're diving right in, which is great because there are literally so many dimensions to this very mysterious um, um, anomaly that's been going on, it seems, forever. But again, you know, one of the reasons why I continue to cover this phenomenon on my show is that there is no question, again, that this seems to be a ubiquitous experience. And each each time I discover someone who's been having these experiences, they'll say to me, unless they've been studying it themselves, most of the time they're not, they'll say something like, I thought I was the only one having them, or I thought I was going crazy. People are shocked when they find out how common this is. Rosemary, how or Sean or both, how common do you really think this is? If if we were to talk rough percentages here, what would be your surmise? I don't think I could even put a percentage on it. However, uh, the more I've talked about uh, shadow people and collected data, um, the more convinced I am that this is probably the most common paranormal experience, if not one of the most common, and that what we see reported is only a tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So many people don't even come forward until they've heard about the phenomenon or read an account similar to theirs, and then it's from the standpoint of like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize that this was real and that other people had the same thing happen. Mm -hmm. Sean, what about you? What, what are you hearing from the from the road. Well, yeah, obviously we don't have a statistical analysis, but I'll tell you just from experience how I, I will be sitting, and of course, obviously when I was making the film, I just said I never heard of Shadow Phenomenon um, before I started making Greystone, that was back in 2009, late mm -hmm. 2009. And that's why the witch sent me the Shadow. So she said, oh, you don't, you don't know about Shadows? I believe in them here. I'm going to send this to you. And it was interesting because I, the Shadow ended up not attacking me because I stayed. I basically kept waking up whenever I heard motion or I felt something in the room. Um, I stayed awake or I kept the light on. And, and ultimately, my brother was a bit more skeptical, you know, skeptical. He was younger than me. He was high school age, and he was you know laughing about it. I said, okay, come sleep in my room. And sure enough, the next day, he calls me and he says, did I have to, you know, he's like, did I tell you what happened? I'm like, what do you mean? I, I didn't see you this morning. He's like, well, I thought, okay. I, 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 he kind of got lost again. It was a bit foggy for him. And he said, well, this, the shadow basically woke me up, and I couldn't move or, or scream, right? And that's the whole shadow attack. Mm -hmm. So now I'm under sleep. You know, right? And sure enough, you know, he had the experience. He'd seen the shadow, and, and it was over him. And, and ultimately, he you know, went back to sleep, and then attacked him the second time. And the second time, he actually was able to move and was able to, 
reach out and touch, and that's when it disintegrated. And that was the last time that I really felt the shadow's presence in my room. Mm -hmm. So in the course of obviously talking to other people, what becomes clear is if you sit at a table with five, five, six people and it's intimate discussion, and people are you know basically able to open up, I think you'll find that one or two out of out of five will say, "Yes, I've had a shadow attack in my life." Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing how people will open up when, and given the right context, if you're willing to hear them and actually not ridicule them, they will open up and tell you things. Even the most skeptical people will say, "Well, there, there was that one time, That's right. you know, when I was when I was <laughs> when I was on vacation, and I, you know, I thought it was like you know." One thing was like, you know, I thought my boyfriend had, had come back early and like he was like a shadow, like reaching and like pulling the blanket. And then I woke up and realized that like, he was hundred miles away in a different city. You know, like <laughs> people like open up and they tell you this stuff. That's right. right? <laughs> so, you know, you hear these over and over and you start to realize, yes, it's a very common phenomenon, but unless you're either willing to hear about it or aware of it, I don't think people are going to openly come out and say, yeah, I got attacked by a shadow last night. Right. All right. Well, I mean, we could go into a whole philosophical dissertation as to why that is, and I think my audience knows. One of the reasons why I'm so dogged in covering this uh, subject, the, the broad subject of paranormal, among other things, is that I think that it is way beyond the factor of novelty. Uh, I keep using that word ubiquitous. It is uh, paranormal experience or extraordinary experience is a part of the foundation of our uh, being here. And I really think it's key to explore. I advocate exploration, safe exploration, of course, uh, to really try to understand, you know, what is going on. And if these sorts of things that I'm uh, not accustomed to seeing are happening, you, what am I capable of? So that's a whole other thing. We could go there. But yeah, you're absolutely right, Sean, that how many people have I talked to, uh, lay people, uh, that would never otherwise open up? They'll <laughs> ask me what I do. One thing leads to another. Oh, let me tell you about the time when fill in the blank. So I've heard it all. You know, listen, I want to, we've got, uh, unfortunately, a little bit shy of an hour today because of schedules, but I want to try to cram as much in as we can. I want to go back to the fear factor, Rosemary, a little bit in these shadow people visits. I think this is a, a very um, curious uh, and profound aspect, that fear, that that sheer terror, uh, in some cases, when these beings show up in, uh, is the common denominator. And I know, uh, Rosemary, you've made the point that the energy that's emitted from the emotion generated by this fear is key for them. Acting is possibly a food source for these beings. This isn't the first time I've heard this. And Sean, I know you've addressed this as well in some of your uh, interviews. In fact, many contend that our very presence and the emotion that we emit can literally feed and sustain whole dimensions. Whole dimensions. What are each of your thoughts on that? Uh, well, I uh, I haven't come across that particular argument about sustaining whole dim dimensions. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure I can um, elaborate on that very much. But in our relationships with various entities that we come into contact with uh, here in our dimension, um, many of them seem to have the capability of drawing off energy. And, of course, we have many vampiric beings in our mythologies. Um, even the uh, in abducting ETs have various invasive ways of uh, taking energy off, uh, as well as genetic material off uh, human beings. And uh, when experiences are negative, uh, whether they're described as fairies or demons or vampires, gin, whatever, uh, there is a loss of life force energy in terms of health, concentration, quality of life, um, and that's been across the board since ancient times. Uh, so there is something about the generation of human energy that seems to be very attractive to, uh, to other entities. My personal uh, hypothesis is that uh, if someone to come and be in our dimension uh, and interact with us, they need energy to materialize and to stay in this dimension. And uh, so it's going to have to come from some source of energy, mm. and we're probably one of the best sources of that. Mm. Yeah. Sean, what are your thoughts on that? Listen, I know that you you had a great show uh, maybe a, a week or so ago from the time of this recording. Um with a gentleman named Steve Richards from Australia, who I found most interesting in some of his assessment on, uh, among other things, the, the, you know, emotion as food. And that's really uh, kind of where I got that idea of possibly uh, 
feeding whole dimensions. What, what were your thoughts on his comments mm. and yours as well? Well, I, I'm not sure I have the notion of feeding entire dimensions, although I've heard the, the concept, and this I think is across many different cultures, they talk about how your thought forms, how your thoughts actually give life to forms. Mm-hmm. And maybe this is in line with the Tulpa concept, although I'm not as familiar with that. But the idea being that our collective imagination can actually uh, bring th- bring things into existence. Mm-hmm. And you start to wonder about, for example, the power of, of that, of, of urban legend or, 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 or thought and manifestation. For example, this, um, what was it, the Slender Man murder that took place recently with these, these kids who were scared of the Slender Man? It was in Minnesota, one of these four towns in life. Say, say again, what, were, what was it called? What, was it the Slender Man murder? Slender that took place Man. Recently? Oh, I didn't hear about that. murders. No. Well, I... Yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to remember if it was exactly the Slender Man, because there were basically there were, there were three kids who were about nine, ten years old, and they, they ended up murdering one of their friends. Hmm. And the idea, the idea that, they, that the girl said was that Slender Man had told them if they didn't kill this girl that he was going to hurt them and their family. Wow. And it makes you wonder... Obviously, are these girls just completely crazy, or did some kind of gin really, really scare the living, you know, scare them into this madness of being able to kill this other little girl? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, now, that's not to say that it was. So again, it, the question is: thought form of Slender Man being the sort of online, you know, cultural phenomenon or meme amongst young teenagers and tween, you know, tweens. Um, did that somehow manifest into uh, in, into the mental domain of the mental imagination? We don't. Under, the point being, we don't understand the power of the imagination. And if you look at the real essence of magic, as laid out in the Hermetic tradition, it is predicated in the imagination of of, of the magician. Mm-hmm. That we have this power of mind, and I think also if you look at the Buddhist tradition and a lot of the esoteric cultures. It's, it's all predicated in the universe, the universe being mental, the mental universe. It's a question of where your mind is, where your focus is. Mm-hmm. The fact that there is no object, and it goes, you know, to even the quantum theori- theoretics about a subjective universe. There is no objective reality. That's right. There is a subjective reality. So there is nothing that you can experience that is not part of your, uh, your karmic destiny, your thought thought patterns, your, um, Basically, your your own willed existence, mm-hmm. in a sense, yeah, coming from both the conscious and mostly from the unconscious brain. Mm-hmm. So when Jung and, and these guys started really inquiring into the nature of synchronicities, it led him to this notion of the collective unconscious. Right? How our unconscious mind is so much more powerful than our conscious mind, and from that, the unconscious of all mankind. How is that? How is that influencing and implementing wars? Mm-hmm social disasters, uh, environmental disasters, right? The weather, everything, all these things can be manifested. And it, you know, goes back to, to many of these, uh, these individual, and uh, um, these various, these various uh, indigenous traditions, let's say, mm-hmm. right? Whether it's the North Americans talking about the rain dance and the notion of being able to be in tune with the animals. And that's what you're talking about, Steve Richards, uh, concept, uh, Steve Richards on Bus Saw in June talking about how there was a certain respect between the animal animals that were killed for, for human food and the obviously and the, and the humans who understood that these animals were being sacrificed for their needs. There's a certain symbiosis between man and nature. Mm-hmm. And the more that we divorce ourselves from that into this autonomous bubble of humanity versus nature, humanity versus the animals, humanity versus the weather, humanity versus the universe, or then it can splinter off even more, because then we don't know. Understand when it comes to a, a world of conflict, we don't understand who we're who we're conflicting with. We assume that all these human-looking beings are human, and yet we don't know what's going on in their mind. That's we right. don't know who is possessed by entities, or what are called, you know, entities, or have made deal with jinns or demons in their heads, right? And thus, who is no longer really a human being? Who is now just looks a human? It really is, is completely uh, mentally gone or psychically detached from this world. Mm-hmm. So I think the point being that we, are, we already are a multidimensional universe 
And we have to recognize that first and foremost and try to find a sort of holistic approach within ourselves because it really begins with every single person trying to find that synergy, that, that symbiosis with family, friends, nature, surroundings, becoming more and more whole again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. I think you're absolutely right. And as I'm listening to it, it just seems as if that there is truly this in, complete confluence of conditions that will allow for all sorts of, call them hybridized situations to happen. I, I want to go, there, there, you said a lot there, but I want to, I don't want to lose this thought. I want to go back to the idea of uh, what I call creative imagination and the power of imagination that I, I dare say most people, at least in modern society and in Western society, really have uh, no idea as to how powerful the imagination is. And needless to say, I think uh, so many people in modern day have lost that power of uh, true individual imagination. But you're right, you know, you know, whether we're talking about um you know, the, the unconscious, uh, well, not just unconscious, but the, the imagination and as it works with even the unconscious mind vis-a-vis Jungian philosophy, but also uh, uh, Henri, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name right, Henri Corbin, who is a French philosopher that believed that the imagination could truly materialize in what he called the imaginal realm, not imaginary, but imaginal. He believed that to be actually a dimension uh, in which one's consciousness could go to be able to manifest and bring it into the physical domain. So all of these things that you're mentioning, I, I think, do have merit. Uh, Rosemary, what <laughs> what are your thoughts on all this? It's, it's a mouthful that Sean gave us a moment ago. You there, Rosemary? Did I lose her? Sean, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, looks like I may have lost Rosemary. Well, let's, you know, let's see if she comes back to us. I don't know if she will. Rosemary, are you there? For our audience, just so you know, we had a little bit of an unexpected lull in our conversation. Um, you know, thank goodness the magic of uh, pre, uh, of production, we can fix a little bit of this. But, you know, we decided, Sean, Rosemary, and myself, that we should maybe let you in on what we think may be going on because it may be relevant to this uh, very un- anomalous and interesting discussion that we're having. We all got disconnected first, Rosemary, um, and then I had to try to pieces all back together and then my computer uh, mouse froze and then Rosemary you had some technical difficulties on your end what is going on here what's going on it's them and uh, them with a capital T that's another name for the gin uh, that way and I found this over the course of time this has happened to me for years so and especially what I get on on the radio or I'm filming uh, to talk about them, there's some kind of technical interference that either um, causes some interruptions or causes delays or even terminates the program. And in this case, uh, I'm sitting here on Skype with my computer on my lap, not touching it, and uh, all of a sudden the power went out. And I discovered that the plug to my computer in the back of the computer had been pulled nearly out so I had been sitting uh, for a while without power and then the battery went and uh, then I had difficulty uh, booting the computer back up and when it booted back up it was missing Skype which comes up automatically on my system so I had to find Skype and re-sign in so it's just like one thing after another yeah. uh, but this is this is very typical Wow and Sean you there? I'm here. Okay. Your thoughts? You're the one that when, when we were trying to rehook up with Rosemary, you were you had made that comment. Uh, not at all facetiously, I don't think. I'm, I, I wouldn't doubt it at all. It's too bad because I think we're having a very valuable conversation, and I do think people need to hear it. Please know, whomever is listening, that this conversation uh, we are not having for the sake of novelty or just curiosity, but rather importance that people understand who we are sharing uh, the planet with, right? Mm. Well, look, I, I, I have no doubt that these beings, that there are beings that are invisible again, that can move things and make things happen without, how do you say, <laughs> from some sort of interdimensional source. I had one night where I had been steeped in this, in this knowledge and, and experience for about two years at that point, and I was in uh, New York at my father's apartment, and I was staying with a couple friends there, and it was very bizarre how the sequence of events was, it was 
literally like a paranormal activity film where first thing it was like one in the morning or two in the morning and there's a door the doorman building so you don't have to get a phone call before anyone comes to visit well these uninvited guests rang the doorbell and I looked out and I saw, I saw a shadow pass across the uh, the, the high hole but I opened the door and there was no one there <laughs> so then I closed the door and the, my and then uh, again, my friend Alex was there, who was the one from uh, from Greystone. He'd gone with me there and, and done the film with me. And he started getting emails uh, with messages that were very distinctly from some kind of something was watching us. And I also got texts on my phone and phone calls from these unknown numbers, and I knew it was, it was them. And so I just ignored it, tried to go to sleep. As soon as I'm in bed, I hear this heavy six foot door just slam shut. <laughs> 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 I, you know, I jump out of the bed, take, uh, get, take a look at the okay, okay, this is, this is funny, guys. I have to try to sleep. Next thing I know, I hear this buzzing sound. And it literally sounds like, like a chainsaw or something is, is grinding. I'm, like, jump out of bed, run to the bathroom, and my toothbrush, my electric toothbrush, is spinning around in circles on the floor. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's your Greystone Park, okay? <laughs> This wow. is just like, this is just kind of fun, like them messing around. Yeah. Them, you know, it's little things that they're doing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this is, this is real. It's yeah. part of the reality. And like, again, it's a question. And I think that at the end of the day, it's not about being, it's not about saying like you have to be um, some kind of like crazy, uh, wild-eyed fanatic or, you know, or believe in supernatural things. I think what people like us are interested in the science. We're trying to say, okay, right. the universe doesn't work scientifically the way you think it works. That's right. But we have some theories that have been set down, and beyond that, we really don't know what's going on. We don't understand how 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 the dimensions interact. You know, we don't understand uh, we don't understand what's beyond a black hole or if black holes even exist. Right? That's still theoret- theoretical. That's right. But the point being, we we have these theories that we put into play. So. If you have experiences that are supernatural, then you have to work those theories into a new model of the universe. And I think that's really the point. Is we're not trying to we're not trying to be um, believers here. We're simply trying to say, based on experience, let's upgrade the science and our, and our scientific models for how things actually work in this universe. Here, here, I agree wholeheartedly. I really do. Where there is uh, room for infinity, <laughs> frankly, and I, and I think that. Again, you know, looking in, looking at uh, how we have been indoctrinated into such a finite model of the possible, um, which I think is no accident, of course. I, I don't know. There may be some faction of our uh, society that doesn't want to see people uh, understand uh, these things. And th- this brings me to another point, uh, Sean, to you again. Do you think that the prevalence of these visits are somehow known or even supported by any faction of our human race, i.e. shadowy groups, pun intended? Could they be working in concert and in cooperation on some level with these entities, you think? Oh, I, I, I don't have any doubt. Really? I don't have any doubt because Look, I mean, we've had people like Michael Aquino on the show, mm-hmm. and we talked about the nature of magic and high, high magic versus low magic, right? The nature of conjuring, you call low magic conjuring entities into, into, into your circle and into your, um, into your ritual. Um, now, that's an admitted, he's an admitted uh, Satanist or Setian who worked as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army in counterintelligence and other matter, so of course he's not going to admit that any of this is being done by other personnel within the U.S. military or associated with the military and or government circles, right? Mm-hmm. But we can, know, we can know anecdotally that rituals are performed by, by powerful bloodlines, by families that have, that have maintained wealth and power over this earth for hundreds if not thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. So what exactly is going on? I think people are are practicing rituals. They are making uh, deals on a spiritual level. There is a karma to a lot of these things, mm-hmm. and it comes you know it comes in different forms. And at the end of the day, what what you have to understand is you yourself, as an incarnated being, do not necessarily remember the deals you've made in past lives. 
you don't know that you come into this body, you may already have sold your soul in a past life. It's just one of these entities. You understand? Mm -hmm. So you're living basically through um, through a much longer history than I think we're, that we've normally been aware of. Right. So it's time for start realizing that we have to start becoming more uh, accountable and aware of these entities, these beings that have been here and occupied this place. And again, going back to ourself and our, and our soul, reclaiming that, claiming, reclaiming that that relationship to the soul, mm -hmm. so that we can actually try, so we can actually make changes and cancel and negate some of these attachments that have carried with us from past existences yeah. before they alter our future. Yeah, that's a good point, Rosemary. I know you've talked about. Um, uh, intergenerational or generational curses as perhaps being uh, one explanation as to why there are indeed, there, there seems to be this multi-generational um, multi generational visits uh, by these people that's very common, or by these beings, I should say. Could there be some sort of a, a you know, a long legacy of, of curse that happened many uh, generations prior to the person that's experiencing them now? Uh, yes, indeed, and this is a factor in some of the complicated cases that we find in entity attachments and uh, hauntings of environments and uh, literally harassment of uh, of entire families and uh, interactions with them. Uh, the uh, onset, the origin, could go way back generations when uh, somebody had uh, the wrong kind of interaction with these entities and a claim was made to the bloodline. Uh, a lot of these entities don't have the lifespans that humans do. They, they exist over much longer periods of time, and they have the capability of not only following generations, but keeping tabs on people in the afterlife and uh, following them through various incarnations. So uh, and part of the part of our solutions to these difficulties uh, is going to come in a complete reorientation toward uh, life after life and whether or not we reincarnate. Not everyone believes in reincarnation, uh, and so for a person who doesn't believe in reincarnation, then taking that sort of thing on board um, gets a little difficult. Uh, mm -hmm it's a little easier to believe that well you know my ancestors blew it so I'm I'm having a problem now and and that is often the factor but sometimes it's the individual themselves and sure. they in a past life uh, had some sort of um, negative dealings with these entities it's a very complicated picture and uh, we're only seeing glimpses of it we have small pieces of of the puzzle and um, we have to be open to all possibilities if we're going to arrive at satisfactory solutions to some of uh, the more difficult uh, cases that, that we're encountering. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, on, on a note where I think we need to wind down, I think this would be an appropriate note to end on in terms of uh, reconciling or, or coming uh, to some sort of solution with this, uh, you know, um, this ubiquitous phenomenon. What might someone do? And I know, Ro, you and I have talked about this many times before. There is no uh, one-size-fits-all solution. Uh, but I would like, in closing, to get each of your thoughts on some suggestions for all of the listeners that may be having these experiences, what they might try uh, to understand, if not to rid themselves of the, the uh, visitors themselves, but to understand what might be going on. Uh, well, Sometimes it's a process of elimination uh, in finding the point of origin, and, and uh, you, ha you have to look for causes in the present first before you start going into the past. But uh, there are things that I've always recommended to people uh, just in general to, uh, to prevent um, problems from happening with, with these entities, and, and that's to have a daily practice of meditation, to... Uh, to keep themselves as spiritual, spiritually oriented as possible and to be mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually as healthy as possible. Mm -hmm. um, we also have to take a look at environmental uh, conditions as well because sometimes when people occupy the wrong piece of property that's occupied by entities, that's when some of these problems uh, can originate. There are so many topical remedies that can be applied that will uh, at least dampen um, phenomena, sometimes uh, 
it does seem to take care of the problem. But uh, these entities have uh, lots of time to play with, and they can go away for a while and make you think the problem's solved and then slide right back in. Uh, so uh, I'd hesitate to rattle off a, a lot of topical remedies uh, because they, they may or may not have any effect on any particular situation. Mm-hmm. Sean, what about you? What are your thoughts on, on this? I, I think those are much more experienced than actually dealing with individual cases. Um, you know, I, I, I agree there's a mixture of topical remedies. There's various you know, things like sage, but, you know, burning sage and putting salts and whatnot, but at the end of the day, you have to figure out what actually is going to work to get rid of these things, and it may require, um, it might require a certain hypnotic regression into your own, like, your own past or your own past lives to understand where perhaps some of these attachments are coming from. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could require just working on your own mind and, and uh, overcoming the fear, basically being able to approach you know, losing the fear of these things because, as we talked about, they, they feed upon fear. So I think that's really where it goes down to is finding that place, whether it be a place of faith, um, you know, whether you find, you know, find it in your religion or your spiritual practice, right? I think that's the most important thing when you're dealing with all these these entities that exist in the universe is that realizing, first and foremost, can you overcome your fear of death mm-hmm. or in, in the unknown, right? Death is basically this barrier. And then if you can overcome that fear... And start of, and start to find your eternal soul, that which lives forever, that's, that which prevails beyond the material realm. Then I think you can start to actually have uh, have an awareness of how much power you have as a, as a, as a human soul. Mm. Well that's said. That's really important. Your mastery comes. Your mastery over these beings will come from that origin, and it doesn't. It's not going to happen overnight because just like anything, it takes training and, and experience to sort of understand how to deal with them. And obviously not from a place of anger and hatred of them, but also from a place of compassion. Because the ones, not all all entities are bad, obviously. There's a mixture of, just like in humans, right, there are those who are more into towards the negative, towards the fear, lust, desires, the the sinful side, right, which basically keeps them trapped in a cycle of feeding. Mm -hmm. And then there's the the higher emotional state that raises your vibration, which is love, compassion, mercy, empathy, um, places... So the Christ conscious, the Christ taught us, right? The Christ consciousness is all about that. So the more you can raise yourself there and approach these beings with a command, but also with the, with the, ultimately with a, with a sense of love and and uh, forgiveness, perhaps, and offering them sort of a sense of uh, a sense that, that you're not, and you're not going to play into their game of being afraid and being fearful and being vengeful and being hateful. That's the game that they will. You can never win. Right. right. Yeah. This goes on and on. So if you can transcend that, I think that's really the ultimate path of finding your own spiritual liberation and hopefully liberation for those for those entities as well who are actually compelled toward the light because that's what you're offering. Yeah. Well said. Well said uh, on an end note. So, uh, Rosemary, where can people go to find out more? Uh, obviously, you have several websites, and but one is specifically focused on the gen and understanding the phenomenon if you could give us that website. It's called JinUniverse.com, and that's spelled D-J-I-N-N, Universe.com. It's uh, a website and also a chat board for people to talk about their experiences. Uh, There are hundreds of postings from people all over the world about how they have experienced the gin, and uh, I have had uh, many experts on the gin weigh in on the site as well with their advice and perspective uh, from dealing with them. It's uh, uh, well worth uh, a look. It's quite educational. My main mebs- website is visionaryliving.com. Fantastic. And, Sean, what about you? I know you've got a bunch coming up on the buzzsaw. Uh, where, where might people go in your archives uh, to, to hear more about this, this subject? Because I know you've covered it on your show, show as well. Sure. Yeah, www.thelift.tv slash buzzsaw. Basically, there's 150 plus interviews that have been there. Uh, so you have to kind of go through the archive and, and take a look. But obviously, you mentioned Steve Richards' interview. Mm. Um, we have uh, Rosemary's. We have a Rosemary's interview. We have many others who are talking in, this, in, in the spiritual domain or the magical esoteric domain. I think it's just up to the, up to you to kind of explore for yourself. Absolutely. And also, 
I would, you know, I would suggest watching Greystone Park, my my feature film, which is on Netflix and iTunes and all that, um, because that gives you a little bit of an insight into the interplay between our minds and our fears and how we manifest these entities into uh, or shadow beings into reality. Fantastic. Well, I'll make sure to have all of those linked up with this show episode. Listen, guys, this has been uh, quite the adventure, I would say. I knew it was going to be a great discussion, and you always make room for a little more. It looks like we got that a little more today. <laughs> so thank you for your time. Um, thanks for all that you're doing, and let's keep exploring, everyone. Thanks so much. Shadow beings, whereby often invisible within our normal environment, can make themselves known in some of the most mischievous of ways, just as it appears they did while recording this interview with Rosemary and Sean. As elusive as these entities are, they are equally relentless in their attempts to get our attention. Will we ever know just what their purpose is, and will they ever reveal themselves for what they truly are? The questions continue, and so does the exploration of this all-too-common phenomenon. If you'd like to learn more about shadow people and the jinn, a great place to start is Rosemary's website, dedicated to jinn research, which you can find at jinnuniverse.com. You may also want to check out Sean's show, Buzzsaw, on the lip.tv, where he often covers the mysterious and metaphysical underpinnings of reality. What a broad spectrum of reality it is. I thank you for joining us on this adventurous episode of Conscious Inquiry. Until next time, I'm your host, Alexis Brooks.